I want to welcome all of the Icelandic Roots members and also the panelists that you're going to see on the screen. And so, first of all, Eliza Reed is the First Lady of Iceland and the author of the book that we will be discussing. Our Technical Director and Finance Director for Icelandic Roots is Doug Hansen. The creator of the Icelandic Roots Book Club is Heather Goodman Litwin. And the lead team leader for the writing group is Becky Byerly Adams. And I'm Sunna Olofsson Firstino, and the president of Icelandic Roots. And I am just so happy that we're all here today to discuss Eliza's book. Um, there's a question and answer. If you have a question or a comment, you can use the Q&A button and it will put it into a string that we can look at and ask her questions. So now I wanna introduce the first lady of Iceland, Madam Eliza Reed, better known as Eliza. And I love that Iceland uses the first names of the everyone. So we can call her Eliza. So thank you for that. Um, she's our first author for the Icelandic Roots Book Club. Eliza was born in Ottawa and moved to Iceland in 2003. She holds an honors Bachelor of Arts degree in international relations from the University of Toronto and a Master of Studies degree in modern history from Oxford University. In 2014, she co-founded the highly acclaimed Iceland Writers Retreat. She has been published in many newspapers and magazines as well as been a frequent commentator on Icelandic current affairs. She has traveled extensively and published about her experiences, which are as varied as Timbuktu and Uzbekistan. She's the Goodwill Ambassador for SOS Children's Villages Iceland, a United Nations Special Ambassador for Tourism, the Association of Women Business Leaders in Iceland, and has been active in promoting the issue of gender equality. She has four children with her husband, Vudni Tihau Johannesson, the sixth president of Iceland, elected in 2016. And there's much, much more we could say about Eliza, but we want to get on with listening to her instead. And so congratulations, Eliza, on your first book, Secrets of the Sprakkar, Iceland's Extraordinary Women and How They Are Changing the World. We are so honored to have you join us. Welcome. Finish. Thank you very much, Sunna, and hello, everybody. Greetings from Iceland. It is a pleasure to be with you here this afternoon, Iceland time, and this morning, uh, where most of you probably are. So I'm here to talk about my book, as Sunna said, my first book, Secrets of the Sprakar. Um, Sprakar is an old and very obscure Icelandic word that means extraordinary women. And so I think even those of you out there who are Icelandic or speak or understand Icelandic quite possibly haven't heard of the word before. Uh, my husband hadn't heard of the word before, which I kind of like actually. Um, it's it's that unusual and old, but I loved it when I discovered this word that we have a word in Icelandic that describes only women in a uniquely positive way. I think that that is a word that we're missing in the English language. And that's why I wanted to use it in the title of my book. And the book is really my love letter to Iceland. Um, as Suna was saying, I, I was born and raised abroad in Canada, and I've lived here for almost 20 years, but I really wanted to paint a modern portrait of the country. And in that sense, as I hope, it's a very uh, informal and warm and, and, and nice portrait of a, of a country using the theme of gender equality. And why that theme? Partially because, or mostly because it's an interest area to me, and also because Iceland has topped the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Index for the past 12 years. So it's something that tiny Iceland knows a lot about, even though uh, you'll learn in the book, and I'm uh, quick to point out that uh, number one doesn't mean that we have achieved it yet. It just means that we are closer than any other country to achieving it. And in the book, I profile or speak to almost 40 different sprakat or outstanding women some by themselves and some in groups to talk really about 
you know, what it is like to be a mother or an entrepreneur or a politician or an athlete or a writer or, or a comedian or any number of other positions in quote unquote, the world's best country for women. And the idea being that each chapter kind of examines a different aspect of society through these conversations with women. And the thread that really runs throughout the book is my own experience as an immigrant to Iceland who also never expected to become uh, first lady of the country and have that wonderful privilege of, of serving in that capacity and what that means really in terms of, of making the most of unexpected opportunities and, and really what it means in the context of gender equality to be the, the sort of female spouse of a male head of state. Um, I was asked to read a little bit from the book, so I will, I will read two, I hope, uh, short passages to you now, and then I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. So the first thing I'm going to read is quite short, and it's, it's it, well, they're both really sort of personal parts of the book. Um, this is from the very beginning, uh, the first chapter, which of course talks about my first experiences moving to Iceland and why I moved to the country. And why did I move to Iceland? I moved because I fell in love with an Icelandic man. It's not an original story. But um, I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the fact that, you know, where my, my husband and I met, which was at Oxford University in England in, in graduate school. And, uh, and, and that, you know, I was 22 years old, I'd gone straight from undergrad, um, and, uh, and, you know, went to all the parties and, and maybe wasn't quite as studious as some of these slightly older students. So I, I will um, read to you a little bit about, uh, about how I met Gulene first. It's hopefully fairly short. So Gulene read the index of every book first, no matter the topic, in case there was an entry on Iceland. He clipped out articles in the newspaper on topics as diverse as historiography and sporting heroes and filed them meticulously by subject in a series of binders on the chance that sometime in the distant future, he could use them in an article or speech, a more prescient activity than the future president knew at the time. From this behavior and the smattering of gray hairs around his temples, I suspected he was marginally older than I, perhaps as wizened as 26. Remember, I'm 22 here. Once at midnight during a house party in a smoke-filled, cramped basement flat, when I was trying to get to know this intriguing but quiet man a little better, he casually mentioned being an undergraduate student when the Berlin Wall fell. I was in grade eight in 1989. How old are you? I asked when I realized that my estimate of his age might be overly optimistic. I am 30, he said and smiled, rolling the R just a moment too long as one would do if speaking Icelandic. This can't be possible, I remember thinking. It was midnight. Two revelers who quite likely did not know each other's names were making out in the corner. Cigarette smoke was thick in the air. No one as old as 30 would ever want to stay out that late in this environment, surely. I nodded, sipped my beer, and changed the subject. What are you up to over the holidays? It was only mid-November, but people were already booking flights home for when term ended. I'll be visiting my daughter, he replied nonchalantly, as if it was so obvious that I needn't have asked. I nearly spit out my beer. Of course you are. If the world is suddenly so topsy-turvy that I am flirting at midnight with a man who has just entered his fourth decade, then it would be perfectly natural that he also has a child and a handsome R-rolling Nordic family back in Iceland, whom he has never mentioned in the two months I've known him. This rather put a spanner, I was in the UK now, so it wasn't a wrench, in the works for my flirtation with the Viking. Game off, I thought, as if this conversation were a weekend road hockey pickup game and his personal life were a passing car. Oh, of course. What about her mother? I ventured. I'm not visiting her, he replied, maintaining eye contact with me. Game on. That's the first little bit. And I'll read you 
the a short introduction from chapter six as well, which is a chapter on the media in Iceland, where I spoke to a number of women about how often women are represented in the media, um, how we portray them and what happens. And I lead into that subject by talking about what it's like to be in the public eye um, as first lady. In January, 2018, Gudni and I visited Stockholm for a three day state visit to Sweden at the invitation of King Carl Gustav and Queen Sylvia. State visits are highly choreographed events, rigid with protocol, that are designed to strengthen ties between two countries. A visiting head of state, almost always accompanied by his or her spouse, will travel with an official delegation of representatives that usually includes politicians, business people, and unofficial cultural ambassadors. The program is scheduled down to the minute, from the time it takes for the president to inspect a ceremonial guard to the three minutes allocated to the head of a research institute to summarize her organization's latest work. At the usually white tie and tails gala dinner with several hundred in attendance, we have often literally been trumpeted into the room. It is during moments such as these that the surreal feeling of my progression from my rural Canada roots to acting as one of the guests of honor in a palace bubbles to the surface. By the time the Sweden trip rolled around, Glynne and I were becoming more adept at the protocol and procedure of a state visit. I was no longer worried that I did not have gloves to match my handbag, advice I had been given before our first state visit or that I even dared to use the same handbag the entire time, rather than coordinate it with each of the eight or so outfits I had for the three day trip. When news arrived just a couple of days before departure that all women in the delegation to Sweden would be required to wear hats for the official welcoming ceremony, I didn't let the fact that I owned nothing more than a toque and that Iceland was devoid of milliners let my blood pressure rise. In fact, after a last minute bulk order of hats from abroad, I even got positive reviews on none other than royalhats.net for my final choice. And you can Google that, it's true. By now, I was pretty used to delivering remarks at events in royal presence, waving for the cameras, and asking challenging yet non-controversial questions during stops at universities, museums, and institutes. The king and queen, with a lifetime of experience in the public eye, were expert at making us feel at ease and at giving us gentle nudges in the right direction, should we forget who was meant to get out of the car first or walk ahead of another. They were charming hosts in every way. One facet of the visit was the inescapable presence of paparazzi. In Iceland, while our official events are almost always covered by local media, the closest we usually get to nosy cameramen is a savvy 10 year old with an iPhone and a social media account. In Sweden and other countries, each stop was trailed by a gaggle of journalists, flashbulbs popping and questions flying. It was invigorating to experience it for a few days, but I am grateful not to live with it sans respite. Midway through the afternoon of the second day on about our fifth stop, I stepped out of the car to notice that one of my earrings had fallen off. They were of Icelandic design, but there were no carrots or precious metals harmed in their creation. I asked the queen if she had seen it on the car seat next to us, mentioned it in passing to the security officials surrounding us in case they came upon it and thought nothing more of it popping the other earring in my handbag. Later that day, in the exactly 53 minutes we had to change into our gala clothing for the evening, I was Googling myself, we all do that, only to discover that a major Swedish newspaper had a big story on the first lady of Iceland's vanished earring. Chaos at the king's lunch, jewelry mysteriously missing, trumpeted the headline in the Expressen tabloid. It had close up photos of me at stops earlier in the day when I was wearing the earring and one where it was missing, 
And it revealed that palace staff had been dispatched to see whether the lost object could be located. Such was the scrutiny of a state visit, and chaos was certainly an overly sensationalist choice of words by the expressin. I never did find the earring. But one more paragraph to lead into the next section. Um, it's true that media coverage was and is significantly more low key in Iceland. But since becoming first lady, I had learned to morph from Eliza changing wet bed sheets and wiping ch stray child snot off the sofa in the morning to Eliza putting on a crisp suit or to the floor gown later and having that image appear in the paper, on television and online. And as a woman who had arrived in the spotlight less with my own identifying characteristics than as someone's spouse, I began to learn both how I could use that to my advantage to carve out the image of how I wanted to be seen and how society was already imposing some expectations of their ideal of a first lady through media coverage. And then I go on to talk about that. But I will leave it at that and happy to answer any questions that you may have. Well, I just want to thank you so much for your selection. Your choice of readings were just excellent. And it shows everyone who hasn't yet had a chance to read the book how engaging it is, how lively it is, and personal. So we, you know, whenever you can connect with the writer, that's such a bonus. And you do such a lovely job. Uh, I wanted to ask you this question. Being as, you know, being uh, the first lady, You've, uh, as you say in your writing there, the good lead in, you're accustomed to being in the limelight, especially when you're in foreign territory. But I was wondering how the success of your book and the whirlwind of interviews and virtual book tours and being nice enough to join us here and, and give our book club the, the best start it could have. Um, how has this affected your life at this point? Um, it's, I'm, I'm, it, it's been really, really fun, I have to say. Okay. And, and in, in some senses, um, I guess it's different and not different. I mean, it's different in the sense that because I am promoting the book more personally than in an official capacity as first lady, mm -hmm. uh, when I travel and talk, it's with a lot less um, pomp and circumstance for lack of a better term than it would be otherwise if there was a more official capacity to it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that, that sense is a little bit uh, different. You know, I'm always traveling by myself, for instance, rather than, than, you know, with somebody from the office or something like that. I think there's also a kind of satisfying angle because, you know, I'm not doing this, uh, say, because I'm married to the president, but I'm doing this because I wrote a book and I wrote the book myself. So I'm kind of proud of that, you know, that the, that the whole thing has come about because of something that I have done myself, not, um, not because I'm there to sort of accompany my Darling husband. Mm -hmm. Becky, I think you were going to ask a question. Well, I was just wondering, what was it like to move to a country? Did you speak the language ahead of time? Was that something you needed to learn? Because I've been trying to learn Icelandic and it's certainly not easy. <laughs> no, it's not easy. Um, no, I mean, so I was 22, as you heard when I met Blinit, and at that stage, I really knew very little about Iceland, uh, even though my mom's family comes from Winnipeg, and we all know the Iceland connections around that part of the world. Um, they are not of Icelandic origin, and, and I just, you know, I knew Iceland was a country, but that was about all that I knew. Um, so I, I really only got to know the country after getting to know Blinit, and um but for me, it was always very important to try to learn to speak Icelandic because I knew that if we weren't always living here, we would at least always have a connection to the country, obviously. And, and that really helped to motivate me because um, uh, generally English is very widely spoken in Iceland, of course. And so it is possible to live here without ever speaking the language. Um, and, and it was very important to me to, to try my best to learn. But it, it, it takes a lot of time and, and diligence. And I think the hardest point is the point where um, you know, I was better than say being able to order food in a restaurant or take small talk so I could have slightly more advanced conversations, but the person who I was speaking to's English was always going to be better than my Icelandic. Mm -hmm. And that's the point when you still have to speak in Icelandic. And that's very 
kind of frustrating and difficult. Um, and that's the part that you have to really work through before you, you get to the other side. Let's talk. <laughs> Thank you. Well, your book was published first in Icelandic did, and you wrote it in Icelandic yourself. I wrote it in English. No, it, it was just, we got oh, permission to um, publish it in Icelandic translation first because of the Christmas book flood when all the, oh. so many people buy books. Mm -hmm. So we really wanted to make sure that people bought copies of it here. And, um, and, and that was really fun. And it was, I did all the inter, almost all of the interviews for the book I did in Icelandic though. And then I translated them into English for the, for the book. And so then they got translated back into Icelandic. So I just hope the people that I interviewed were happy with how that sort of <laughs> game of whispers worked. <laughs> oh yeah, that's interesting. Um, what, are you working on a new project now or are you just in this whole business about this one right now? Yeah, I mean, I can't believe how much, uh, in a good way, promoting this book has taken you know so much time. Mm -hmm. I think I was on the road and I, I took 15 flights or something in the month of May. And yeah. um, so I was doing lots of... Um, doing lots of promotion, but it's been really, really fun. The whole process has been fun. So, um, and, and really came about because of the unique circumstances during the pandemic when, you know, there wasn't as much as first lady right. and we had to cancel the Iceland writers retreat, but we just held that event and we're holding it again next year. So we're also in the, the planning stages for the Iceland writers retreat next year. So I hope I get another idea to write a book, but then, you know, to find that not only, you know, you can't schedule two hours to brainstorm a book idea. So no, we'll just see tell us more about the writers group uh, that you do. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really fascinating to me. Yeah. So um, my friend, Erica Green and I, she used to live in Iceland. We started a group called the Iceland writers retreat um, or an event in, we had the first one in 2014 and it's held every year at the end of April. And it's for anybody who likes to write, whether, you know, you don't have to publish and you don't necessarily have to want to publish, just anybody who likes writing as a hobby or a craft. And then we all have a new event called the Iceland Readers Retreat, which is almost for book clubs, really. So actually, if you have a book club that wants to come to Iceland, um, we have these two groups together and both groups really get to know Iceland's literary heritage. So it's being held in Reykjavik, which is a UNESCO city of literature. And we do these tours um, in the countryside, which are really kind of all-inclusive tours. So our tour guide is a writer. And we stop at Gluvra State, the home of Helder Laxness. And we have a reading by an Icelandic author. And then we have extra stops that have other readings. And we have a pub night uh, with local music and, and local authors. And we always have Icelandic authors featured as part of the program. And we have a Q&A panel with visiting faculty. And, and then the writers group take these small group workshops with writers who come over and between five and 15 people in each class. And their workshops on all sorts of things to do with writing. And the readers group um, have an extra panel with, um, with Icelandic authors. So uh, from across all genres. So we have, you know, poets or play children's authors, crime fiction, that sort of thing. And then we also have a featured author from abroad each year who comes and, and does like an in-person lecture on their work. So this year we had Adam Gopnik who works for the New Yorker and uh, we haven't announced yet who will have, um, next year but it'll be somebody somebody like that so it's a really fun thing and um if anybody wants to come that would be great and and certainly you know i think it's perfect for icelandic connected book clubs to want to come and learn about that that would be really fun you know icelandic roots just published a brand new children's book and coloring book that's a with it gudrudur saga mm. and uh brindis viglundsdottir was the author and mm -hmm. she lives in Iceland, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gay Strandamo was the um, illustrator mm -hmm. and Icelandic Roots was, we were just the help to make it happen, you know, mm -hmm. behind the scenes. And then, um, so it's just published and we're super excited about it. It tells the story of Gudrudur, um, Thorbjörn mm -hmm. our famous ancestor who you know, and um, she is talking to her grandson. So that's really, really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a question in the chat. Okay. How did the legislations for gender equality, such as maternity and paternity leave get passed? Was it over a period of time? Was it because of the number of women MPs? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's over a period of time. 
And, uh, and, and for example, when you talk about uh, first, there's legislation for guaranteeing maternity leave and then maternity and paternity leave. And then that the period of time has gradually been expanded so that, you know, there's even more leave than there was, for instance, when I had my children. So it's absolutely an ongoing process. Um, a, another big area of legislation has to do with laws on equal pay for equal work on um, gender quotas when it comes to the boards of tr publicly traded companies. So those are all things that, that get gradually introduced. Um, there is very high representation of women in parliament, and, and now we have 47.5%, which is the highest non-quota regulated uh, limit. Uh, to some degree, of course, I would say that you know the, the, the more diversity you have, the, the more people are going to be thinking uh, about benefits to everybody. But I think I, I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily frame it in that way, because that might imply that somehow men we're less supportive of the idea. And that's, I think, not at all the case. I think that I think that if there's one single thing in a sense that has been helping us in this battle in Iceland, it's this idea um, that as a society, I think we're less having to argue, is it an important objective to try to work towards gender equality, but how are we going to get there? And part of the reason that we, um, you know, broadly speaking, have kind of passed that tipping point is because we know that greater equality benefits people of all genders. It's not something that is just for women. It's not something that only benefits women. Uh, you know, societies that are more gender equal have longer living populations and happier populations across genders, and, um, and they are more peaceful. And if you look at examples like parental leave, we see that, you know, certainly fathers who were then all of a sudden had the opportunity to take many months of paternity leave, that's something that has been very beneficial to them as well. So uh, um, I would say that, it, you know, it's a gradual process. And I think that it, it's very key that, that it's not seen as a sort of us versus them zero sum game. Yeah, that's very interesting. Do you think that, or what is the percentage of men that take that leave? Is it, is it? I don't know the percentage offhand. I think it's very high. I think um, the, the, the impediment in some situations to men taking it is that the, the leave payments are paid by the government rather than an employer. And they have a ceiling, if you know what I mean. So if you earn, you know, millions and millions of kroner a month, you can't get 80% of that, it's 80% of your salary. So you can't get 80% of that, you get it up to a certain amount. And men still tend to earn more than women. And especially if you're a man in a particularly senior position who have a significant salary, it's then more of a significant salary drop for you to take um, that amount of leave. And so even though it's use it or lose it, meaning that a mother can't take that leave if the father doesn't take it, it still would be too financially detrimental to the family um, if that's the case. But I, I, I'm, I, I think it's a, it's a decent majority of men who, who take their leave, yeah. That was my other question is, if the father does not take their portion, can the mother take that portion? Okay. No, it's, it's use it or lose it, unless you're a single parent, of course. Um, but if you are two parents, um, raising the child, then both parents, you know, there's a, it's divided in three. So each parent gets a chunk just for them. And then the third chunk, you can split either way. So you don't have to split it 50, 50, but, um, you know, you, you know, there is a chunk that is exclusively reserved for one parent versus the other. And that's exactly why it's done so that, um, you know, to try to even it out. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, I know that you're on a time crunch. Eliza. So um, we are going to have to thank you so very much for coming on today and um, visiting with us about your fabulous book and for all your past accomplishments and best wishes for all of your future endeavors. We'll be watching you, of course, and following you on all of your ad adventures. Uh, thank you to Doug Hansen for the technology behind the scenes, for Becky and the writers group and all that they're doing to um, help promote writing within our Icelandic Roots community, and especially to Heather for creating this Icelandic Roots book club. Um, we will be meeting once a month to discuss Icelandic books and bringing in authors, which I find just so fascinating that we can do this. Um, with the authors from Iceland, Canada, the United States. So come and join us at Icelandic Roots. 
And thank you for this wonderful webinar, Eliza. Our very best wishes to you. My pleasure. Thank you for tuning in and, and hi to everybody over there. All the best. <laughs>